Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Women's Global Gathering at the, as part of the 36th Annual Space Symposium. That's right, I just want to repeat that. The 36th Annual Space Symposium in person in Colorado Springs at the Broadmoor. So thank you. Please continue to enjoy your meals during our afternoon event. I am honored to serve as the Master of Ceremonies for such a special occasion. Today, we're pleased to have you joining us for our fourth annual Women's Global Gathering. In previous years, this event has brought some of the industry's leading women together to share how they have navigated their respective careers and what they've accomplished in their fields. Well, today's event will be no exception. We hope to inform and inspire all of you, including the next generation of women leaders in the space industry. I would like... I know SJAC, you're out there, so you're our next leaders. I would like to thank our sponsor for today's lunch, L3 Harris. Thank you for all you do. Today, we're honored to have Stephanie Dickman, the Vice President, Strategy and Business Development for the Space Business within the Space and Airborne System segment at L3 Harris Technologies. And we're also pleased to have Jackie Schmall, General Manager, Intelligence, Surveillance, Reconnaissance, Space, and Airborne Systems for L3 Harris. She's also joining us as the moderator today. Now, yes, they definitely deserve a round of applause. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome to the podium, Stephanie Dickman. Thank you, Shelley, for the warm introduction, and thank you, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Hello, and welcome to the fourth Women's Global Gathering Luncheon at the 36th Space Symposium. I figured out I have attended the Space Symposium for the last 18 years, but I have never been as happy to be here as I am today. To see your smiling faces without masks on, it is wonderful. Um, I hope you enjoy the lunch today, and I hope you meet some new friends and acquaintances. As Shelley said, my name is Stephanie Dickman. I'm the Vice President of Strategy and Business Development within the Space and Airborne Systems Division at L3 Harris Technologies. With over 47,000 employees, L3 Harris is a global aerospace and defense technology innovator. We deliver solutions that meet our customers' mission-critical needs and we provide advanced defense and commercial technologies across air, land, sea, space, and cyber domains. You might be familiar with some of our work. We are responsible for the position, navigation, and timing signal for the GPS enterprise that helps you find your way around the world. 
we've built the most sophisticated meteorological imaging instruments for NOAA satellites, which are essential to support severe weather forecasting. And we've partnered with NASA for over 60 years, currently supporting the James Webb Space Telescope and the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope programs. And most recently, we've won prototype contracts in the missile warning arena, supporting a space-based sensor development program and building flight space hardware to detect and track hypersonic missiles. It has been a fantastic week here at the 36th Space Symposium. Thank you to the Space Foundation for organizing yet a very, another very successful conference at the Broadmoor, despite the many challenges. As you've learned this week from the many featured speakers, talks, exhibits, and forums at the conference, you all know it is a thrilling time to be in the space industry. And we at L3 Harris are honored to be a part of it. My colleague Jacqueline Small will be the moderator for today's event. Jackie is the general manager of the Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance Division within Space and Airborne Systems. After lunch, Jackie will be the moderator for our panel, and she will introduce the impressive panelists that we have for you today. Thank you very much for taking the time to attend our event. Enjoy your luncheon and safe travels home. Thank you. Good afternoon. As Stephanie said, I am Jackie Schmall with L3 Harris. Um, so I'm pleased to have the opportunity today to be the moderator for today's panel. And I am joined today by an esteemed team of panelists. Before I introduce our panel, I'd like to take a minute to reflect on the past year and a half since we sat in this room together. Since the last Women's Global Gathering, we have experienced many challenges and opportunities in space. Several firsts included the US Space Force established by the FY20 NDAA, We had an all-woman spacewalk. <laughs> Two commercial launches of humans into space that were not astronauts. <laughs> Kamala Harris was named the first female vice president and highest ranking female official in US history and chosen to chair the National Space Council. We had the Perseverance rover that landed on Mars, and NASA's OSIRIS-REx landed on an asteroid and collected a sample. And finally, we returned human launch capability to US soil for the first time since 2011. We also had several anniversaries. The 60th anniversary of the first person in space Yuri Gagarin. We had the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. And the Hubble's 30th anniversary. And of course, we had COVID. <laughs> In today's discussion, we are going to dive deeper into some of the new establishments that have brought with them policy changes, changes to our military forces, and new opportunities with a little slant towards the contributions of a diverse workforce now and in the future. Each of our panelists will provide additional insights into our current dynamic space industry from their unique perspectives. And at this time, I would like to invite our panelists to come forward and take their seats. Great. Thank you, panelists, for joining us today. I'm going to walk through some brief introductions, and then I'll ask each of you to tell us a little bit about your organization, its mission, and its role. Major General Deanna Burt, Commander of the Combined Space For Forces Space Component Command, US Space Command, and Vice Commander, Space Operations Command of the US Space Force. Thank you. 
Ms. Lisa Callahan, Vice President and General Manager for Lockheed Martin Commercial Civil Space. <laughs> Professor Dr. Pascal Ehrenfreund, President of the International Astronautical Federation. <laughs> Ms. Audrey Schaefer, Director for Space Policy, National Security Council. And finally, Ms. Vanessa Weish, Director of the NASA Johnson Space Center. All right, at this time, panelists, please provide your opening remarks, starting with Deanna. Well, good afternoon. Uh, I am honored to be here today. Uh, my name is Deanna Bird. I am the Combined Force Space Component Commander. I am privileged to be a component commander uh, to General Dickinson at US Space Command. Uh, and the mission we do out at Vandenberg Space Force Base is to make sure we are integrating those combat effects, space warfighting effects, to the multi-domain fight, both to our joint and multinational partners on behalf of the nation. Uh, so I'm proud to lead a very diverse team uh, who delivers those effects day in and day out, 365 days a year. Me personally, uh, my husband just retired uh, from the Air Force. Uh, I am a career space operator, have just joined the Space Force three months ago, so very proud to be a new guardian. Um, <laughs> thank you. On a personal note, again, my husband just retired from the Air Force. I have a stepson who just left for college, so totally understand many of you as you've had youngsters leave or start back to school. Uh, so happy to talk about any of those things, uh, but proud to be here today. Thank you. Okay, I'm uh, Lisa Callahan. I have the privilege of leading our commercial civil space business at Lockheed Martin. I often say I have one of the coolest jobs in the world, and I firmly believe that. Um, at Lockheed Martin, in our commercial space business, we build spacecraft that are going to take humans back to the moon and beyond. Mm -hmm. Um, we have uh, spacecraft that are robotic, that are exploring our entire solar system and have been to every planet in our solar system, including Pluto, which I still include as one of our planets. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> we all like Pluto. We have the honor to work with NASA and NOAA in building weather satellites, Earth uh, science satellites um, to protect lives and property, and uh, we build commercial communication satellites that connect the world. Um, personally, um, I have a daughter who was home for the last year because of COVID, who just recently left for medical school, and I couldn't be prouder, but I'm back to an empty nester again. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you for having me here today. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm Pascal Ehrenfreund. I'm the president of the International Astronautical Federation. And it's an international uh, organization, and I just want to say, founded in 1951 in the times of the Cold War, it's now the world's leading space advocacy body with 400 uh, members, 400, over 400 members from 70 countries. And uh, we really are looking forward to share knowledge, promote international cooperation, and uh, building the workforce and preparing the workforce for, tomor uh, for tomorrow. So. Um, Personally, I'm um, very much involved in space exploration since 30 years, and it has been already mentioned. It's an incredible, exciting time right now uh, with so many actors, commercial actors, investment, and uh, also so many countries. It's really an international endeavor, and I'm really proud and, and, and also happy that I'm still involved in some of the exciting uh, space missions. And um, I am um, actually moving into my fourth uh, executive job. And um, uh, it's a bit strange because it's the fourth uh, uh, leadership job I have where I'm the first woman. Yeah, so uh, 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 that, 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 that sounds always a little bit strange. And um, so I will be leading the International Space University, many of you know, which is situated in Strasbourg, but has, of course, a hub in North America. It's a space elite school, and I think it is really, really important. Um, it was a topic at this conference in particular, STEM education. We have a, a, a great lack in, 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 in STEM uh, uh, people and students, and we need really uh, to um, educate and uh, to develop uh, a really an exceptional workforce for space for tomorrow. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Audrey Schaefer. I'm the director for space policy on the National Security Council staff. Uh, what that means is that I'm the lead for national security space policy within the executive office of the president at the White House. Uh, and the lead for uh, space matters within the National Security Council reporting up to the National Security Advisor. Uh, so I advise the President and the National Security, uh, ad excuse me, the President and the National Security Advisor on military, intelligence, civil, and commercial space policy matters. I do this in close coordination with my colleagues at the White House, um, colleagues from the National Space Council, our new Executive Secretary, Shrak Parikh, uh, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and of course, the Office of Management and Budget. Um, and we also work, of course, closely with all of our colleagues from across the departments and agencies, whether that's NASA, the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, Commerce, FAA, DHS, and the list goes on and on. Um, I am an alumni of the International Space University, since you brought it up, uh, the summer program in Beijing in 2007. Um, and on a personal note, I, I do have a son who uh, reminds me that he recently celebrated his three and three quarter birthday. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Vanessa Weich, uh, director of NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. We also have a field center in White Sands, New Mexico. Uh, I'm very proud to lead over 10,000 employees and with our mission of human spaceflight and transformation. And uh, right now at the Johnson Space Center, we're very excited. We have many programs that are going and underway, um, uh, like uh, General Burke, uh, we do have uh, operations 365 days with the International Space Station. Uh, some of the imagery that you're seeing as you um, are looking at the screen uh, are just some of the exciting things that have been happening in space. Uh, we're very excited to be working in low Earth orbit. Uh, we're leading an effort called Commercial LEO, and uh, that is uh, taking the opportunity uh, to share and uh, have um, payloads and soon to be private astronauts that will be going to the International Space Station and eventually free flying space stations. In addition to that, uh, we are working on the Artemis program. Uh, we're working on the Artemis program first with a program under the Science Mission Directorate called Commercial Lunar Payload Services. And that will be robotic payloads going to the surface of the moon launched by commercial companies. And that's gonna be happening in 2022. Uh, but we are also very proud of our human efforts with the Orion, uh, working with Lisa Callahan and Lockheed Martin, and uh, with the Gateway uh, program. And the Gateway is a small platform that will be in cislunar space that will allow our astronauts uh, to get uh, on the Orion to the Gateway, and the human landing system will meet there and then go to the surface of the moon. So we're very excited about what's going on in space. Uh, we're working all of these efforts with our commercial partners, our international partners, and with others across the agency. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I am a mother and I have one son uh, who actually during COVID uh, received his master's degree, so that was a good use of COVID time. <laughs> and I'm um, super proud of him. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so hopefully this mic is still working. All right, great. So that was amazing. So this is gonna be a, a great panel. Um, so let's start with some questions. So just as a reminder, there are going to be audience questions. I think they'll flash a number up on the screen um, where you'll be able to text in your questions. Uh, first, we'll start with some questions that we really wanted to get to, but please feel free, as, as the panelists mentioned, to ask away. All right, so the first question is going to go to Vanessa. Um, human space flight and travel interests are on the rise in civil and commercial space. What are the opportunities and challenges across civil, commercial, and DOD from this rise in space travel? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, so the opportunities are, are, are vast, you know, because as um, we have others that are participating in space, especially uh, commercial opportunities, um, it allows for example for NASA to think about doing things differently and expanding what our capabilities can be by leveraging what we're working on with our commercial partners. So for example, uh, with commercial cargo, we learned a lot 
and uh, we expanded into commercial crew, as you said. We now are launching again from Florida. Uh, but to do that uh, requires not only NASA assets, but it requires DOD assets, FAA assets. And so as we have more and more companies um, doing their own adventures, then we're going to also have opportunities for us to have uh, support to those activities as well. So um, I see it as an opportunity and a challenge because we need to make sure that we have the STEM workforce uh, available to, to meet the demand that's um, coming across to us. And um, so at NASA, you know, we have efforts towards STEM engagement, uh, just like many of the other um, organizations, but we know that we have to bring the next generation along so that we can continue to expand in space. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, Deanna, did you wanna add any, anything to that? No, I, I, thank you. I, Vanessa is and the team at NASA are great partners. I, many of you may not know, uh, on behalf of General Dickinson, uh, I have the responsibility, very important responsibility, of human spaceflight support uh, day in and day out for NASA and our government uh, astronauts as they go out. So that's both in launch, uh, in recovery, in any emergency, uh, search and rescue or anything, God forbid something go wrong, how do we, how do we take care of and support uh, NASA? I think the challenge for us uh, and on General Dickinson as the combatant commander is as we start to see more commercial travel, uh, how will we as a department in support of that commercial travel uh, if something were to happen? In other domains, you will have you know, uh, aircraft that go down or abandoned ships or things that are sinking. How do each of the departments play and how does that get coordinated uh, in emergency situations? So I think uh, that's definitely something and an opportunity in the future moving forward. How do we team and work with NASA uh, and with the commercial entities? Uh, the other challenge that I would pose is that uh, you've heard many people from the stage talk about uh, the number of objects and proliferation of satellites uh, and congestion. Uh, so the DOD tracks about 32,000 uh, objects, whether they be live or not. Uh, and that is, again, now we're putting humans in the domain and more frequently. And so how does that change the calculus of if, you know, we've talked in the past, if you heard General Hyten and others say satellites don't have moms. And so if something bad happens to a satellite, people go, well, it's a machine, no big deal. But now we're talking about Americans, humans from around the world traveling. Think about going from suborbital from uh, Paris to LA uh, or traveling in that respect. And if something were to happen to those folks. so. Uh, working congestion, space traffic management, how do we do those things moving forward uh, as a nation and as a globe to ensure we protect those humans uh, out in the domain and beyond is going to be very, very important. And that's going to be a team effort across commercial, coalition, uh, and civil to make that safe, uh, that space traffic management and safety of flight. Yeah, and I would just like to add, um, yeah, I would just like to add, uh, absolutely, I mean, we have a long-standing relationship. And, um, you know, for the, the 18th, um, the guys um, in my flight operations directorate reminded me of, you know, just the many times that, that you know, they make the contact and then we work it together. Uh, it's a very close relationship. Thank you for that. Yeah. Anyone else want to comment? Or? Good, okay. So let's go to the next question. So Audrey, how does the vice president's leadership of the National Space Council impact the entire community? Thanks, Jackie. And so I know you already said it, but I want to say it again in this room. Um, I think, you know, in this room, at this gathering, we should first just celebrate that our nation has its very first woman vice president, uh, who is also the chair of our National Space Council. Um, now, putting aside whether she's a man or a woman, I think you know, the real benefit of the National Space Council is that it keeps advocacy and focus on space issues at really the very highest level of our government. Um, and you know, actually, regardless of your politics, I think you can say that the National Space Council in the last administration was incredibly effective. Um, we saw you know, a lot of the accomplishments that Jackie already mentioned, uh, the stand-up of the Space Force, Space Command, the Artemis program, the Gateway program, this bird an incredible private sector, um, you know, just amazing things that that body really uh, drove. And, you know, it's able to do that because of that leadership at the highest level. And so this administration really saw the progress the Space Council had made uh, previously and recognized the benefits and the role that space provides, you know, to humanity, to science, to defense, uh, to our economy and saw how having that advocate at the White House could really be an enabler across all of those activities. Um, and so the decision to not only retain the Space Council, but to keep the Vice President and 
as its chair, um, I think really shows you know, this administration's commitment to space, the priority they're going to place on it, and I really hope that we're able to make just as much progress in this administration as we did in the last one. Yeah, I would also um, like to add, I, I agree, you know, we had um, some of the, the policy goals uh, in place from the last administration. Uh, we've made uh, very good progress, and I think we will continue to do that. You know, like as um, was mentioned, working on debris uh, traffic management, that's very important. But now with this administration, the focus on climate change, um, STEM engagement, uh, those priorities uh, helps us all to work across agencies together on those. And then the other thing I'll mention, you, we did not talk about yet, it's, it is Women's Equality Day today. So. Oh, <laughs> perfect timing. <laughs> that was good. I should have had that in my bullets. All right, so uh, Pascal, we're going to move over to you. Um, can you speak to some of the international and commercial opportunities in space that you're seeing from your perspective? And how has the space sector really changed in the last decade? Well, I think it has changed enormously, and uh, it is very dynamic, and um, you see that also on this uh, space conference, which is an enormous portfolio and topics which we are discussing. And um, I think uh, we have seen uh, the, the, um, uh, that space is much more accessible, that uh, we have market disruptions, uh, that we have new technologies and artificial intelligence, and only to name uh, a few, re re reusability. These are really, really important topics uh, which lead, you know, to innovation and to new commercial players and and, and to new companies. So uh, I think we are living in an incredible time, as has been mentioned already, and uh, that has to uh, that leads also to uh, the fact that much more uh, young professionals are entering the space sector. Mm -hmm. And we um, see that through to entrepreneurship, we have um, you know, uh, exceptional entrepreneurial leadership, uh, we have uh, strong investments, and one has to say that uh, when you look at the statistics and the data, in, uh, uh, in, even in the year of COVID, the space mm -hmm. sector is incredibly yeah. robust. Yeah? And um, so um, we have seen, it, for instance, in the International Astronautical Federation that we have a really new generation and that we have a complete shift, um, uh, not complete shift, but we have a shift in generations. We have 50% uh, of our participants are now under 35 years old. And this is really amazing and I think it is really a very important thing. You see it also here. The, the, the next generation is interested, is pushing, and uh, is bringing innovation and um, you know, thinking out of the box. And I think we have also to adapt uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, these new uh, movements and uh, to the commercial sector and organizations like uh, the IF or also Space Foundation to have new activities which really address that and which foster that and support that. Thank you. I'm going to throw a curveball. Lisa, do you want to add anything to that from your, from your perspective? You know, you've been in industry for, for a while. What, what, are you, what are you seeing that's changed? So I think, um, I mean, if you just look at where we are right now in the whole space domain, right, there are more um, commercial companies in space than ever before. There are more uh, space agencies than ever before. There are, there's more investment dollars being flown into space than ever before. All of that, I think, is just going to help um, with the excitement of where space can take us. Um, and, you know, it's the innovation that will come out of that diversity um, and um, how all of that can just come together to help us as, uh, inspire the world, really, as we move forward. Um, it's, a, it's been mentioned throughout the conference, but I think it's worth foot stomping, right? It's a, an incredibly exciting time to be involved in space, and um, everyone in this room should be really proud of what they've accomplished. Any other comments? Okay, um, so Deanna, from your perspective, what are some of the trends in the aerospace industry and, and what are the, some of the opportunities? There's been a lot of trending. I think everyone recognizes, if you've heard General Raymond speak, we talk a lot about standing up uh, the United States Space Force and to be a digital service. Uh, the Space Force is born in the digital age. Uh, and it's different than the other services who were largely you know, born and, and built in the industrial age. So how does that change the technologies? I've been very excited this week uh, with the industry engagements that I've had uh, to see that all of you are actively getting involved in software management, 
uh, again, it's not about building satellites, it is, but it's about how do we make them software-based? How do we get multi-band receivers that can be we reprogrammed quickly as the enemy evolves uh, or the threats are there? Uh, I think having more software-based, again, this gets back to what we've been talking about, the technology. Uh, the younger generation gets it. How do we use artificial intelligence, machine-to-machine -machine operations uh, as we go out into this domain? And so it's really important. Uh, things are getting smaller, microsats, which makes our job at, at CIVSIC a little harder to keep domain awareness. Uh, but again, how do we work through those things of making things smaller, more digital, uh, more reprogrammable moving forward? Uh, I think it will help us, again, continue to extend our operations in the domain. Uh, we also have other challenges, different types of threats in the domain, and how do we respond to them. Uh, Hyperglide vehicles, uh, other capabilities that uh, can be difficult and uh, more complex problems for us to solve. How do we work through those? So again, the technology enables a lot, but then in the same breath for the threat, how do we respond, detect, uh, and report those types of information. So again, that coalition of commercial coalition partners and industry is gonna be critical moving forward. Thank you. Lisa, did you wanna add something to that? Yeah, I, um, I'll, I'll just take what General Burt said, and um, which was really from an operational point of view and just say from an industry's perspective as a developer of those systems, we're really using that digital transformation technology and bringing it into our workflow, um, whether that's the, through the entire life cycle from our design into our manufacturing and really making that seamless. Um, uh, really eliminating human error in the future, um, and I will foot stomp your um, comment about software and reprogrammability, and um, I think that's critical to the future, particularly in keeping pace with the threat. I agree. Thank you. All right, back to Audrey. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of talk recently about norms of behavior. Where are we with developing space norms, and what more work needs to be done? Yeah, thanks for that question. The norms is an area that I've worked in for a really long time in my career. And I actually think after years and years of talking about norms and saying that we need norms, we are finally starting to have some norms actually fall into place. Um, you know, I've been thinking recently about like three different categories of norms or grouping norms into three different buckets. Um, the first bucket are norms for you know, safety and sustainability, norms that apply to every satellite operator, regardless of whether you're military, intelligence, commercial, civil, it doesn't matter, right? Just like the traffic rules that every single car has to follow on the road, um, you know, these norms provide safety and predictability for the operating environment for the good of everybody. Um, and in that area, we've had great success. Um, the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space adopted long-term sustainability guidelines in 2019 that are directly addressing some of these challenges. Uh, the second category of norms, I'm calling the the final frontier norms, right? The norms for how we do space exploration, resource utilization, right? How we act, how we operate, how we collaborate, um, you know, on the moon, in cislunar space, right? In sort of pushing the frontiers of, of our space exploration activities. Um, and in that regard, we're also seeing uh, progress, right? The Artemis Accords that NASA rolled out last year, I, I should have brought the number, but I didn't. Um, we've got a number of nations who are signed, you may have the number. Um, <laughs> we have a number of nations uh, who've signed up to the Artemis Accords. And and so we're starting to see, again, some coalescence in that area of what are the, uh, how do we behave um, uh, on the moon and in other celestial bodies. And then the final category are norms really for, uh, excuse me, for stability and security in the outer space domain, right? So those that help us reduce the chances of misperception, uh, reduce the chances of miscalculation, and ultimately help enhance international peace and security. And what we've seen in that area is just about um, six weeks, no, maybe more like eight weeks ago, uh, the Defense Secretary Austin uh, released a memo on tenants of responsible behavior. And it really outlines, at, at a very high level, uh, kind of what behaviors, uh, at least DOD space operations, will follow. Um, and I think that's really an exceptional start for having that conversation both with our allies and partners as well as internationally about how we create those um, norms really for security activities. Um, so I, can't, I guess like sort of the bottom line from my perspective is uh, although I do think we have some more work to do, I think we're really in a great place right now. Pascal, can you add to that from an international perspective? Yeah, I think um I think it is really important that everybody is uh, looking in the future uh, that we need to evolve towards a common, uh, shared, and international uh, framework. 
um, and um, uh, that for many, many different topics. And we have a lot in place, which is soft law, and I want to come back to planetary protection because I think it is really an important subject. Um, it is also really important to have the dialogue with the different stakeholders. And when you look at planetary protection and you see all this enormous amount of, uh, of missions now uh, from commercial actors, we, you have to have a dialogue and really to inform each other. Because um, a commercial player which um, uh, has a mission for Moon or Mars has really to understand what is the latest knowledge of this planetary body and uh, what um, uh, is actually going to happen, what is eventually destroyed, or what could actually be of help to know. And I think this dialogue, we have uh, once at um, um, George Washington University Space Policy Institute written a really big paper on that, to, uh, to bring all the people together to have the stakeholders really discussing and uh, then going from a soft law to more binding agreements. And we have right now uh, the Committee of Space Research in place, uh, which has a panel on planetary protection and it is strongly linked to the United Nations, to UN COPOS, and has now um, uh, representatives of the space agencies included. So that's a really good step where you have scientists, where where you have also um, uh, commercial players and where you have the space agencies sitting on one table and discussing uh, 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 the future, uh, you know, space exploration. And I think this is the way to go. This is a, a very, the dialogue is always important because uh, the stakeholders have different languages and we need to pull it together. <laughs> Great. So Deanna, how do these space norms apply to you and the DOD? No, I, I think, uh, I, I'm very proud that the Department of Defense uh, led with how we do space operations, or at least from the SecDef's perspective, the tenants that we have followed. I've been a career space operator for 29 years, and, and those are the tenants we followed, and that's what I learned as a youngster and how we've operated uh, throughout my career. So I was very proud that we put those forward, and we had a responsibility to, right? We've been operating in the domain for a very long time. I would ask this audience to think about that we have entered in the space domain kind of backwards. And what I mean by that is, if you look at uh, most other domains, we entered with them uh, in a position where there's an entrepreneur, uh, an inventor, someone who builds something brand new, and then at some point the military sees the value of it, and we then militarize it, and norms and behaviors have been created. So I'll give you the example. Henry Ford builds a car. We build roads, we talk about how you operate on the road, and the military looks at the car and says, hey, that could be a tank. <laughs> okay? Same thing, Orville and Wilbur fly an airplane. And at the end of World War I, we go, man, it would be great to fly over the new intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance as a battle space. Eventually, we could drop bombs off of it. Oh, hey, there's other guys with airplanes, we're gonna shoot at them. Do you, you see what I'm saying is the norms get built, have been built historically in domains by other travelers, adventurers, other people, and then the military, the government come along with uh, on top of some behaviors that have already sort of been established. In this case, because of the cost of entry and where we are, that doesn't mean industry wasn't engaged with us hand in hand building those capabilities, but they really were built from a defense position with Sputnik. And you've heard many people, General Hyten talked about it. Many people have talked about the history of space and how we, it was a space race as part of the Cold War. So I would think it's important that the DOD at least put out front what we've done, which says here are our norms. Uh, I would also say as the Department of Defense, we recognize we are not here alone. This is critical that, as, as Pascal said, this is all the partners have to be engaged in this discussion. Uh, we just offer one perspective. Uh, I think it's important that our coalition partners, we have the, uh, the Coalition Space Operations Initiative, the CSPO Initiative, where we meet with our partners. I also think the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, France, and Germany, and we talk about these things and we have dialogue about what is acceptable behavior or norms of behavior. Because from a Defense Department perspective, how do I determine what is something that is hostile? Mm -hmm. I have to first define what is normal so that then we can hold others accountable or defend when we have the inherent right of self-defense in the domain once we've determined something is irresponsible uh, or is considered a hostile act. But you can't get to those definitions until you first define what is acceptable. So I'm really excited about where we're going. There's a lot of uh, things and work we need to do, and I agree uh, that we've got a lot of work to do, but I, I am very proud that we're doing it as a coalition with the industry and our commercial and civil partners uh, and internationally because that's what it's going to take because it's for everyone to be free and transparent and use the domain for all. Thank you. I love the examples of the cars and the planes and puts it all in perspective. All right, so Audrey, what is the role of space in strategic competition? Okay. 
Um, all right, well, thanks for the double header there. Um, so, uh, okay, so, um, so this March, um, the administration, the president released a document called the Interim National Security Strategic Guidance. It's sort of like a mini national security strategy, um, and it's intended to provide guidance, uh, you know, for the national security apparatus of government uh, while we develop our more fulsome national security strategy. And um, if you haven't read it, I would actually really commend it to you. It's a pretty short read, and uh, it does a really good job of articulating this administration's policy priorities as well as its values. Um, and what it describes is really a, a challenging global landscape um, and one in which China is really the only nation that's able to kind of marshal all of the tools of national power, economic power, military power, technological power to challenge you know, the international system. And I actually think that last part's really interesting too because it's not just challenging sort of the United States, it's actually challenging the entire rules-based international order the United States and its liberal democratic allies built um, after World War II and that frankly has benefited us greatly um, in those intervening years. Um, and so when we confront this arena where China is seeking to really challenge that um, world order, I look at space actually, and I see space as not only an arena of strategic competition sort of in and of itself, but also a tool that we can use as part of that strategic competition among nations. And I, you know, I could go into much more detail that I won't today about how that kind of breaks down across all those different tools of national power. But just to give you a few examples, right, if you think about economic competition, I think we have an incredible opportunity with this burgeoning space sector that everyone has talked about on the stage already to really enhance the competitiveness of U.S. industry and to think about how we level the playing field for our commercial companies so that they compete, uh, can compete internationally. Um, if you look at influence, right, and prestige, obviously space has been used for that, uh, you know, and it's, it's our entire history. Um, and you can see where uh, programs, uh, you know, what, where China is actively pursuing uh, programs like its own space station and uh, its own lunar uh, program to enhance its international prestige. So, so how do we in the United States and with our uh, partners um, sort of do the same and actually also use those opportunities to expand international cooperation to partners who may not have been our traditional sort of space uh, partners, right? I think there's a lot of opportunity for so-called soft power um, and building relationships if we think in that mindset. And then finally, we've talked a lot about norms already, so I won't really spend too much time on that, but you know, with that influence comes the opportunity to kind of shape that international order for space as well, to build upon the order that we have here on Earth and extend that um, into outer space. Um, so when I think about space and strategic competition, that's kind of where my head is. I think it's a really helpful lens to look at our activities and think about what our priorities ought to be and what our policies ought to be. And so I think it's, uh, so that anyway, that's where, really where I'm gonna be thinking over the next couple of months when I kind of expand upon what's um, you know, in that national security strategic guidance into something for the space industry. Yeah, I'm thinking next year they need a panel on norms <laughs> with the way you're speaking on it. So, um, Deanna, did you want to add anything to that from a perspective of strategic competition? No, I think from a Department of Defense, we, I agree with everything Audrey just said. I mean, we have to work this together. And competition is obviously an opportunity uh, for all of you in industry. The more of you that are involved, the price point goes down for the Department of Defense on the capabilities that we want to pursue. And so it, competition is, can be a good thing. When we talk about strategic competition, though, with our uh, potential adversaries, again, the key for us and the secret sauce is our relationships, both with our civil, commercial, and coalition partners. How do we continue to build uh, and encounter that competition by having those key strategic relationships that allow us uh, to continue to operate. Also resiliency and being able to fight through if we are contested. Uh, we do not want a war that extends into space. That's not good for any of us. But we need to be prepared as the Department of Defense under the leadership of United States Space Command to fight and win if asked and called upon by the nation, and we will. But we will do that in partnership uh, with our coalition. We will do that uh, through resiliency and we will do that through making sure that we're continuing to work with industry to keep building new capability and staying ahead uh, of our competitors. Thank you. All right, so Vesa, we're going to go over to you. And so we're going to flip into a little bit of human space travel that we talked about in the beginning. So um, now that there are more... more strategic cooperation. Oh, do you want to... Okay, so we could, we could do that. So <laughs> do you want to add on anything to the no, last no, question? No, no, just the flip of that is, you know, we have been... Um, you know, working internationally using the space station, prior to that, NASA's history, other missions as well. But if you think about, you know, cooperation, the International Space Station having humans on board for over 20 years working together internationally. The crew that's on board today represents 
um, the European Space Agency, the United States, it represents JAXA, many um, of the com countries working together. And then what we're doing uh, going forward, you know, we are working with other countries that are interested in um, becoming a part of space, expanding. So we talked about the Artemis Accords mm -hmm. and working with uh, additional countries, uh, but also um, branching out and working uh, with like United Arab Emirates mm -hmm. and them um, becoming a part of what, we, you know, using it for soft power, you know, for good. And so um, what I do think that's what we'll continue to do. And we're doing that now also with uh, Artemis, with Gateway, other international um, players as well. Thank you. So let's now pivot to uh, humans in the space domain. And uh, Lisa, I'm going to throw you a curveball because we're going to start with you. So, you know, you're working. It's a long week. I, <laughs> I was on a panel before this, and you're throwing curveballs? Yeah, Lisa, <laughs> Lisa only found out she was in this panel like Monday, I think. So <laughs> thank you, Lisa, for joining. Um, you know, when you talk about humans in space, and you're, you're working a lot of programs where you're, you're trying to do just that, um, what does it mean now that there are more humans, you know, commercially um, going into space? Um, how do you protect those people? Uh, Deanna touched on it a little bit in her introduction, um, introductory remarks, but from your perspective, are you seeing anything different from an industry perspective? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think Deanna um, talked about it in terms of, um, the debris that we have in low Earth orbit and you know when we've got humans that are in low Earth orbit today and will continue in um, the future I think w we need to find a way in which we can protect them um, and even for um, spacecraft like Orion that are going to go beyond low Earth orbit into the moon um, it's more difficult today to get there than it was in the Apollo days right and so um, I think there's an opportunity there from a market perspective um, to really look at how are we going to handle orbital debris um, and how are we going to eliminate that in the future. And I know there's a lot of people out there that are thinking about that, but with all the flow of um, money that's coming into the commercial space in, in, in industry, I think there's opportunity there to really focus in on that because I think that's a huge challenge for us going forward. And I don't see it slowing down in terms of the number of satellites that are being launched and. Um, we're inevitably going to have collisions, which will just create even more debris. So, um, so if you're out there as an entrepreneur, start thinking about how to get rid of it all. <laughs> yeah, and actually, you weren't you weren't on our prep call, but Deanna, you were you were actually talking about that a little bit in terms of you know what are the new companies that are going to come up now because of just that. Yeah. Well, and, and I think it's really important that this come either from industry or from a coalition or. Uh, space exploration or folks who are looking at this because if it comes from a Department of Defense perspective It's immediately assumed to be dual use So if I can reach out and pick you up and put you into a lower orbit or deorbit you obviously I could do that And it would be a military purpose um, If I can reach out and touch you and put gasoline or something in you if the satellites were built that way or to attach uh, An ability to give you more life on the satellite or vehicle uh, those things can also be seen as dual use or as a military implication. So again, I think we as the Department of Defense absolutely are interested in that and we want to wring every taxpayer dollar out of every capability that we have. We have many satellites that were designed for seven years and we, they now can drink and they're 21. So I, I would say we do that every day to try to, to really bring our capabilities as, as long as far as we can. But again, we see value uh, in on-orbit servicing. And I think from geo and below, uh, it is a nice to have, uh, I think, as Lisa is talking about and what she's doing, uh, beyond GEO, uh, is XGEO is going to be required. Uh, and how do we set up those refueling stations, either at Lagrange points or in various places, uh, to create, we joke in the military, we have our AFI station to get your Slim Jims and your, <laughs> and your gas, but wh where are you going to go to get those things? And so I think it's definitely an imperative as we go beyond GEO, what do we need to do and how do we do servicing? Um, moving forward or for to be successful. I, I'll just um, take what you said and make it a challenge to industry. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think we will not be able to reach the space economy that we want to have if we don't solve the problem of debris. So um, from a Lockheed Martin perspective, I am happy to partner with whoever wants to help in that domain mm -hmm. because I think it's a problem and a challenge that we all have that we have to solve together. Yeah, thank you. Lisa, can you talk, just since you have your open mic, um, like on architectural planning, when you're planning to do, um, whether it's a constellation, working with your customers, how has some of this debris really affected how you look at a space architecture? Well, I think what we're seeing is it's starting to impact um, 
our ability for when we launch, what the you know, orbital trajectory is going to be for that launch, particularly as we start to talk about flying humans, right? Um, and so it's going to start to, and is probably already impacting, you know, our ability in terms of those launch windows that we can have. And, um, you know, we do a lot in planetary missions, and we already have a very tight launch window for those just because of how the planets align and being able to get to those planets. And so I think we have a lot of expertise on, um, you know, how do we manage the risk and making sure we're meeting the launch dates and things for those. But it's going to be um, even more important, I think, across all of our programs as we start to do that with our human race as we start to fly humans um, because it's going to start to impact that. It just goes back to the... Um, the need in my mind for how are we going to address the debris issue because without that, we're, we're, you know, it's um, space traffic management um, is just going to be a, a, a problem that's going to start to, to impact the ability and, and for that space economy, I think, in the long run. Right. Yeah, and I would also add, yeah, for architectural planning purposes, yeah, you're right. You, if you actually uh, saw the, the, the imagery of the debris that's available, that's around us today, it might scare everybody in this room. However, <laughs> but we do know that we can, you know, protect ourselves. And, you know, again, thank you to the A-team for helping us with the, the collision avoidance. But one of the things that we can do is we are, can look at what are the best practices for um, assessing the debris, and making sure that we understand where it is. And then for those that are building new satellites, helping them to understand the best way for them not to have debris come off of their satellites. So um, we are working up a best practices handbook. Uh, and I, I'm being told that it's going to be available on NASA.gov. But we do want to make sure that others are aware that there are ways to mitigate the debris that you put out. Thank you. Thanks. So we're going to now do our little switch to the diversity and leadership kind of flavor. I want to remind you to text questions if you have them, but we have our own too. So um, Vanessa, we're going to go back to you. So what are some of the experiences and contributions that you've had that have really prepared you to be a senior leader? And what lessons did you learn along the way? Yeah, so for me, um, Jackie, I think the, the one thing, uh, I started out as a, a project engineer uh, building uh, space hardware. And so learning lessons about what it takes to fly uh, and certify hardware for space. But um, going from there to being a program manager and understanding uh, leading large complex missions and large teams. So having that, those experiences. But in addition to that, taking advantages of um, leadership programs and training. Right now, today, I'm, I'm a fellow in the International Women's Forum being uh, exposed to leadership uh, where there are women doing incredible things like the women here on this panel mm -hmm. uh, and having allies, you know, that you can go to for uh, conversations to learn from one another. Uh, so those are the, some of the experiences that have prepared me to get to where I am today. I was fortunate um, to grow up through the ranks of the Johnson Space Center. Uh, so going from being a project manager uh, to being a manager of shuttle missions, uh, missions that actually build the space station. So I understand the systems. I understand the business that I'm in. And so that has prepared me to then lead the organization that I lead today. Thank you. Deanna, do you want to add? I, th I think it's for, in the military perspective, it's always first and foremost learning your weapon systems, being an expert at what you do. And again, one of the things I tell my young airmen and guardians all the time is when you stop learning, you stop leading. So I agree with Vanessa. It's taking those training opportunities. I've been blessed to go to a variety of, of uh, great schools within the Air Force, U.S. Air Force Weapons School, the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies, professional military education at, at the major and lieutenant colonel level. So, I mean, all those opportunities are what shape you and build you. Uh, moving forward. And I agree with Vanessa. I, I've been blessed to have uh, allies, males I've worked for over the years who've been willing to give me a chance uh, and give me a leadership opportunity and to let me loose and let me lead. I know I was probably scaring many of them, um, but uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Even my current boss uh, has been great about empowering us and letting us lead as functional components uh, and get the job done. Uh, but it also takes not just allies, but it also takes mentors. So I challenge all the women in the room uh, or folks of diversity, do you mentor and pay it forward to the folks who look like you? Mm -hmm. uh, I've had amazing mentors, some of them in this room, Pam Lincoln, uh, Nina Armagno, uh, General Lori Robinson, uh, many that were just ahead of me or I got the opportunity to engage with who took the time 
uh, and would talk to me and share personal things. Uh, mentoring is tough. Uh, both sides have to build a relationship of trust, and that means making yourself vulnerable. And as a senior leader, that sometimes can be scary when you start to tell personal stories uh, to the folks who work for you because you're sort of showing them the, hey, I'm not, I'm not perfect. <laughs> Uh, and so sometimes that can be hard, but also for the mentee to trust you and be able to tell you and the problems and the things they're struggling with and the challenges they're having, that's very difficult. But that's how the trust is built. And so I would just say, if you are from a diverse community, whether it's ethnicity, race, gender, um, sexual orientation, I don't care what it is, are you paying it forward in that community mm -hmm. and reaching out proactively so that people are not intimidated or scared to talk to you uh, and that you're making that step, because sometimes it can be intimidating for mentees to find you. And I've been blessed that there have been uh, women in front of me who've been more than willing uh, to mentor me, along with the allies and males that I've worked for uh, and the great leaders who've given me those opportunities. Hey, Lisa, did you want to add? Before yeah, next one? I, I think um, uh, Vanessa and Deanna had great comments. I think I'll just add on to your mentoring comment, if I could. Um, Maybe unlike most of the women that are up here, I didn't grow up in the space area. I've only been working in space for the last five years. And I've had the fortune of being able to move around Lockheed Martin in a lot of different domains. I started in undersea systems. I've done training and simulation. I've done missile defense. Uh, went back to undersea systems, worked at corporate, and now I'm in space, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's been a lot of transitions in my career. And one of the things that I have done, and I would encourage all of you, women or not, to do, is to build a mentoring board of directors. Uh, and by that I mean one of the things that's helped me is when I go into a new job, I find somebody that can mentor me on that organization. What's the culture of this organization? Who's who in the zoo? Um, who does what? What do I need to do? Somebody that can mentor me on the customer side. This is a new customer. I don't know how they operate. Um, you know, what are the relationships I need to build there? Somebody that can help mentor me on the technology side. I've had to learn new technologies in every one of those new roles. So who are the people that I can lean on to help me understand the technologies of this job? And then the career mentor piece. So if you think of yourself as the center of that, um, building your board of directors, of mentors that can help you, and every time you take a new job, it's probably even more important to, uh, to fill, form that critical board of directors to enable you to be successful in those new roles. Yeah, thank you. So Pascal, how do we increase the number of women who pursue and advance their careers in technical fields as well as the aerospace industry? Well, I think, um, uh, although this panel shows a little bit a different picture, uh, I think um, there is still a lot of progress uh, concerning uh, gender and diversity uh, in, in, in the space sector. And um, uh, I think uh, it is important to, uh, like organizations, men, like for instance the IAF or also the United Nations, the space foundations, to have a lot of activities because the space sector, uh, the space economy, uh, is uh, really evolving uh, globally, and uh, we um, really need to uh, diversity. It will be a very important component in order to address uh, future questions, to uh, uh, engage in new markets, and uh, to make everything really innovative and, and, uh, and, and interesting in the future. I think this is uh, very important, so we have to uh, find initiatives uh, and create initiatives uh, on how to foster diversity. And of course, we all have our programs, um, but I think we have to make a stronger, uh, a stronger uh, lead because there are so many new nations now from the international perspective coming in. And we have, for instance, created in the International Astronautical Federation a committee on developing countries and emerging communities, where we really uh, try to do capacity building. Simone Di Pippo has uh, to get, today discussed uh, how uh, uh, capacity building is done in the United Nations for the space sector. So there are many activities, and we will probably have to increase it. Because when you look at the studies, diversity uh, um, is really making an impact on the economy and on the success of companies. Uh, there are studies which have been published. And um, um, I think um, uh, one aspect is really important is we have to convince women very, very early on to enter um, into the STEM sector and to get them really interested. So we can, of course, here discuss a lot, but we have to start much, much earlier. Yeah? Kindergarten is, of course, one thing, yeah? but uh, um, uh, we have really to continuously, because there is a, a, a very, very stra a strange uh, 
situation that we need an incredible amount of STEM educated uh, people and uh, of course also women and uh, we don't find them and uh, this uh, lack of, uh, of, of STEM employees is all over the world and we have to make um, a, a really an, an important impact and uh, already discuss that uh, in, in schools and really make uh, activities and uh, I think uh, more at large. And uh, something what I see, especially in Europe, I, I don't know the statistics of the United States, but we are losing women uh, through the leaky pipeline. This means we have a lot of um, graduates now. It's getting more and more with the young generation. You also see when the next, uh, uh, next generation, when the space generation comes here, this is more or less very balanced, 50 to 50 percent. But uh, when we are looking in academic careers, um, uh, we have as many graduates and um, uh, when you go up the, the academic ladder of professor, you have the fork, as we call it, 80 to 20 percent. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is at least something what we, uh, what we see in Europe and we have really to find a way, you know, to, uh, to uh, intercept this leaky pipeline. And it also, uh, there is a new statistic you have probably all uh, read. Uh, that uh, there are more women in the space sector now, but uh, they get in particular about Earth observation data analysis in, in the space exploration sector, launching sector, so we still miss a lot of women, in particular also in, uh, in leadership positions. And I think we have really to work together at different levels and very early on in order to encourage that and to change the picture uh, in the future. It's not only enough to have uh, them graduate, we have also to accompany them and this, there were many examples which have been said about uh, mentorship. In, in Europe, we have something which is not uh, very popular, which are mandated quotas for women, also in leadership positions, in board of trustees, and so on. It's not always very popular, but it helps. And, uh, but I think the most important thing is inspiring uh, young women and telling them there are so many exciting positions actually available. And uh, please uh, be interested, uh, join us. You have all the abilities and, 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 and be one. Good. Of, of them. So we do have some audience questions that I want to hit. So I know you want to say something. Well, if, I could, if I could just add really quickly on this, and, I, and I, just really quickly, because what you just said uh, really sparked something that I that I kind of wanted to build on, which is you know I think we don't do enough a good enough job in the space industry of really telling the story of all of the different kinds of jobs mm -hmm. you can have and still be in the space sector. Um, okay, thank you. So it was worth it. Okay, and and just to you know, real quick, like, um, and I and I really re for me personally, um, this was actually something that I was challenged with earlier in my career. Um, I thought I wanted to be, I knew I wanted to do space ever since I was a little kid, and I assumed that meant um, I had to be an engineer. And so you know, I went off to college. I studied engineering. I have a very nice degree. It hangs on my wall. Um, and but I learned in that experience that I didn't want to do uh, aerospace engineering. With all due respect to the aerospace engineers in the room, um, and it took me a while to really figure out what I did want to do in the space industry. And so I used, you know, internships and things that were available to me as a uh, college student and then as a grad student to try and test out different, like, parts of the business. And I was lucky enough to, you know, kind of find my passion in space policy, which is really what I've done ever since. Um, but I think, you know, particularly uh, with women, like, we just don't explore those alternative career paths. Um, and so I think the more that those of us who aren't doing, uh, and as and, and of course, as important as STEM is, for those of us who aren't sort of like strictly doing the science or the engineering, I think it's really important to sort of be evangelical about all the different opportunities that are present in the space sector, whether you want to do business development, policy, um, you know, government relations, uh, public affairs. I mean, the, the, really, it's just truly a, a, every industry has a wide range of opportunities sort of depending on, you know, your strengths and your interests. Thank you. So, yeah, everyone likes that one. It's okay. <laughs> So Vanessa, you are extremely passionate on mentoring. Yep. So tell us about a um, previous example of mentor that helps you to get where you are or things that you do in mentorship. Oh, absolutely. You know, so for me, uh, as was discussed, you know, I know for myself that I would not be where I am today if it had not been for mentors, allies, others that took the time 
to help me understand, like I said, the business of space, helping me to, to understand the, the norms uh, that um, I needed to, to progress through my career. And so because of that, you know, I completely agree. I'm gonna double down on, you know, asking those in the audience to be mentors. Um, because it, it's not only about you know, what you are providing to someone else, you also gain when you're in that relationship. But right now today, I, I mentor several people, um, but one of the, the people that you know, kind of stands out the most is a college student. And um, I'm mentoring her through the Brooke Owens uh, Fellowship, if any of you guys are involved with that. But um, this young lady, uh, she's at uh, Rice University, and so she's an engineering major. She's trying to decide what to do. Her passion is to get a PhD, but she has a professor telling her, yeah, you don't need to do that. And so I'm telling her, follow your passion. It's going to always lead you to where you want to be. But so it's very important for us just to, you know, take the time to, to mentor others. Um, you know, just one thing that sticks out um, for me as a, a mentor, and he didn't even know he was a mentor, but it, it was a, a guy, so, you know, I'm a black female, grew up in South Carolina, and I'm working at the Johnson Space Center. I'm working with a Caucasian male from Huntsville, Alabama, who works for Boeing. And you would think we don't have a lot in common, right? But uh, he really uh, took the time just to you know, share things. But I'm in the shuttle program, and I'm working like crazy long hours. And I'm thinking, you know, gosh, I really cannot continue to do this. And so one day they came in, they told me, well, we need you to work another, you know, two weeks of night shifts. And I'm thinking, I'm about ready to say I'm done. <laughs> and so he comes up to me, he pulls me aside. He says, Vanessa, you know, people are watching you and they know that you can do this. You just keep doing what you're doing and you'll be, you'll progress. And so I said, okay, I'll calm it down. I'll work the two weeks of night shifts. <laughs> and so then a position came up, and that's actually to be the, the, the position I told you about in, in the shuttle program. And I applied for that position. And a lot of my peers also applied, and they were like, well, when, when I was selected, they were like, well, how did she get selected? And he told them. She was the one willing to work the overnight shifts when the rest of you guys weren't. <laughs> so, you know, but just, you know, taking the time to just offer advice, you know, career advice or personal advice or whether it be uh, as women, you know, um, relationship advice on raising children, et cetera, it really will make a difference. So perfect segue. We got a question from the audience as, as a man in the space industry, what can I and my other male colleagues do to help garner better representation of women within the industry? We don't have a lot of time, so we're gonna do like rapid fire. So let's start with Lisa. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, the, for the men in the audience here, be a sponsor for a woman. Their sponsors are, um, can help mentor, but really their role is when a woman is not in the meeting or in the discussion, you are sponsoring for them. You're standing up for them, you know them, you know their capabilities, and you're the one in the room that's their cheerleader and pushing them to do that. That's great. I'm doing rapid fire, so if, if anyone really wants to answer again, Pascal. I would say ask for a diverse slate. There you go. So if you're a hiring authority and they hand you a, a slate of, and I love all my white males, but if they hand you a slate of all white males, you should go back to your HR folks or your S1 in my case and say, hey, I know there's other talented candidates out there from diverse backgrounds, race, race ethnicity, gender, go get me some others because that, that slate doesn't work for me. I need a diverse team to bring critical uh, thought to my team and I don't want everyone to look the same. Uh, and I actively do that, and I, I push the team to give me qualified candidates and to pull them out. Because sometimes people are very qualified. They're probably not cheering for themselves. They may be working very hard night shifts, and no one kind of sees that. And, and how do you go pull people with that demand signal to get the slate? Great. So very short, um, um, we have a, a mentorship program, launch point mentorship. If you uh, are available, please help the International Astronautical Federation and be one of the mentors. <laughs> <laughs> and can I just say, foster a, a culture that allows for a good work-life balance? Because guess what? Men can go home at 5 o'clock and have dinner with their kids, too. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. All right, so here's another one. Um, what advice do you have for women who are now just starting their careers in the space industry? And this is going to be our last question. 
Um, let's start with Deanna, and then we'll go to you. I would say uh, be brave, be bold, lean out, do things that make you uncomfortable, uh, and get out of your comfort zone, and don't be afraid. Uh, we've all been there, uh, but uh, you will realize that as you lead out and do that, that you'll find others right alongside you who are learning and adjusting as well. So again, be bold, don't be afraid, get out there and get out of your comfort zone. Yeah, and believe I, in yourself. Okay. Good. And, and I would also add, you know, be te technically competent, you know, learn what your, your job is, make sure that you understand it, absolutely. And then the other one, I, I completely agree, take risk. Um, you know, I have applied for many jobs and I did not get them all, but from the ones that I got the no's, that, those were the ones that I learned the most. It taught me to go back, prepare myself, and get ready for the next time up. I think uh, perseverance is a very important thing. It's a quality for all of us uh, uh, today, but also in particular for women. Don't, don't be scared. Uh, it's all manageable. And um, I, I think it's, uh, it's just uh, the self-confidence, which is really important for women. Uh, you can do it. Uh, and I think it's in a nutshell. Yeah. And I want <laughs> Yeah, I would just say be yourself. Um, be the best version of yourself, but, but be who you are. Great. All right, we had a lot of other questions that just float in right now, so next time ask them earlier. <laughs> um, so thank you very much, panelists. Um, we're honored for all of you to have joined us today, shared your knowledge and experience. Um, as Stephanie had mentioned, this is the fourth year of the Women's Global Gathering. Um, thank you to the Space Foundation for making this a reality for all of us. Uh, thanks to my company, L3 Harris, for sponsoring. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the Women's Global Gathering Luncheon. Uh, thank you all for joining us today and being active participants in today's discussion. Thank you.